Hello everyone, welcome to Pop Quote Ex, or welcome back to Pop Quote Ex if you've been here before. Thanks for coming on back. <laughs> well, this is episode 130. Um, my name is Danny, and along with Gabriel, we're here to talk about all things pop culture, which I think, Gabe, what you just said, um, is kind of being dominated right now by the Britney Spears book. Yeah, I think everyone's talking about Britney Spears and her tell-all uh, book, specifically a lot about Justin Timberlake, mm-hmm. about how, you know, they got pregnant. Um, she terminated the pregnancy basically because Justin wasn't ready to be a father, um, that he cheated on her. Uh, she cheated on him. Uh, just a lot of like dirt on, on people. <laughs> um, I'm not, I'm not a big fan of Justin Timberlake. So it doesn't really sway my opinion about him um, mm-hmm. all too much. I never really cared for him to begin with. Um, so my opinion stays the same. Not a real big Britney fan either, so I I could care one way or the other. Um, but what kind of makes me think, uh, you know, what what this whole thing makes me think about is, um, do you think stars should write tell all books like that? Like, is that anyone's business that, you know, she had a pregnancy, she terminated it, they cheated on each other. I mean, this is all when they were fairly young. I think when they were like mm-hmm. nineteen. I mean, is that is that even entertaining to to read and to to listen to? Um, I I don't know. Like, I guess if you're a fan, you want to know a lot about the pop star that you idolize. But isn't that a bit much? I mean, I feel like it's a little bit of overkill. Like, it's it's being too sharing with your life. I think I think in a memoir or a tell all book like this, where it's in the past and they basically want to kind of like clear the air and set their story or get their side of the story out there. I think yeah. that I'm okay with that more so where you look at like um, the Smith family and how their, their drama is being played out in like real time. Right. Cause they're, yeah. they air out all their laundry in real time for everyone to know about, which I think is a little bit, maybe too much, but I'm okay with tell all books. I mean, if people, didn't want things to be known about them. Maybe they shouldn't have done it to begin with. I know, I realize, like you said there, they were young, they were kids um, when all that stuff transpired. And I think if anything, it hurts Timberlake the most because I, I heard that he was planning like a a comeback album tour or, or whatnot that had to be yeah. pushed pushed back or pushed aside because of what was revealed in this book. Yeah, But I mean... It, I don't think if 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 you had to divide them into Team Britney or Team Justin, if people who on Team Justin's side read all this, would that sway their decision or feeling about him? Yeah, probably not. Yeah, I I don't know if if it's really anyone's be, who I, I'm wondering if anyone was a fan of Justin's and then now has become uh, a detractor or is no longer mm. a fan of his. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It just, it all, it all seems a little bit too much. Like I just, I, I'm not really interested. I, you know, I'm like a fan of, of like Lady <laughs> Gaga, for example, I don't really necessarily want to read or know about every single thing about her. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, You know, I know she shares certain struggles that she has, things like that, that, that make her a bit endearing. Uh, but this tell all just seems a little bit too much. And it, and it's drama that was like, that's decades old. It's not really yeah fresh or relevant it's it's stuff that's like super far in the past and it just seems um i don't know it just it, it seems a little vindictive on her part i know that that's probably a really unpopular opinion because uh, a lot of people are saying that she's just telling her side of the story versus what justin timberlake did which i get but um it just it just seems like why now it, it's it's just a little bit too much for me I think yeah, exactly. it's, it's just a cash grab, right? I mean, people, like you said, there is people who are people who want to know every single facet of their lives. And I, I for one, am not like that because let them have their private life, what they do behind clothes. I don't want to know how the sausage is made, so to speak, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's, it it can be just like seen as that. I think she just maybe, hey, it's a quick payday. Oh, I'll just write everything I know that happened to me. Which in some regard, if it yeah. if I haven't read the book and I don't know what's all in it, but if it focused mainly on her, like her mental health struggles or the struggles of the conservatorship, I think that might have been a, a more compelling read. 
because that is yeah. what she went through as opposed to you know like, like you said the decades old um drama between them yeah i think that she does touch upon that but of course the media is going to focus on the more yeah. salacious parts of it and mm-hmm. wants to reignite feuds between justin timberlake between her and christina aguilera and it's like it just it seems like everyone who's involved is so so old that it it just seems like <laughs> it's a bunch of older people <laughs> involved in like, like some high school stuff and it just yeah. seems weird that fans are like so yeah uh, so into it like there was an example that I'll, I'll share that I saw someone on TikTok in the book it says that that Britney Spears alleges that she was with Justin Timberlake in Las Vegas and he cheated with someone in Las Vegas. This fan looked up who else was touring in Las Vegas, saw that No Doubt was opening for U2 and is now alleging that Justin Timberlake had an affair with Gwen Stefani. And I'm like, it's so, such a big reach. It's so far-fetched. And like, it's just, that's so weird to me that there are people that are like trying to be detectives and sleuthing online to try to, connect all these dots to try to accuse people of cheating uh you know on um with justin timberlake against britney spears and Mm -hmm. it just it seems very nasty it just seemed very productive um and and that's not to absolve justin timberlake of any issues like i said i was not a fan of his to begin with um so uh, there's no like love lost between uh, me and him like i i <laughs> never was a fan of his never will be um but it, it just seems like it's just it's it's a really weird thing to be that involved in and for it to be entertaining i guess for people using it yeah. for entertainment sake yeah. um it's weird but you know, are, I, are there any stars that you would read a biography or tell a book by or have you i've read um dave grohl's book okay and it wasn't like a tell all because he didn't he got into some of the, you know, basically it was more about what made him who he is. It's called storyteller. So he tells the a bunch of stories about growing up with like Nirvana and like the Foo Fighters and everything that come, you know, that went into that. So it wasn't more of a tell all. But I don't know if I would ever read a, a gossip book, so to speak. Yeah. Right. Be- even though if it's coming straight from the horse's mouth, it, is it considered gossip at that point? Yeah. Is it though? If yeah. it's if if the person who it happened to is telling you about it, is that still gossip? Yeah. Is it? Okay. Well, yeah, I don't know if I'd read a gossip book. Yeah. It's just I, it's... I don't think gossip is only when someone's talking about someone that they're not involved with because she's it's definitely gossip about Justin Timberlake, right? Because she's That's true. she's okay, alleging yeah. that he cheated on her. Yeah. Um, or she's alleging that, you know, other people did things. So um, I think that it is gossip. I mean, if she strictly did what she, her, you know, talked about her own actions, what uh, okay. first person like then it wouldn't be gossip. But, um, you know, she's speculating about activities that people, what other people did. So I think that that would be construed or or categorized <laughs> as gossip. But Fair uh, aside from that, um, something that was much more entertaining that I did get to was um killers of the flower moon um mm-hmm. the martin scorsese film about the osage county um indians or native americans and the the kind of horrific uh th- things that they had to endure um mm-hmm. specifically one particular family uh, that the the main cast kind of um uh, depicts um really good film really well acted by by robert de niro leonardo dicaprio and um the rest of the cast um, I think they did a great job of representing the Osage um, nation um, in particular. They, they, I know that they consulted with them and um, they did a great job with that. The visuals are really great. Uh, this, it is long. It's, you know, it's like three and a half hours, um, but it is quite interesting. Um, it's, it's sort of, you know, a, a piece of history that I think people should know about. Um, and it's not necessarily the most um fun thing to watch i mean because it's really kind of uncomfortable seeing some of the horrific things that happened mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. but it is i think important for people to to know that that happened in history and that 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 is part of american history so um i would recommend it for that um but yeah. it, but it is a well done film 
cool yeah i want to see it and i think i think we do have to watch the uncomfortableness i think we can't just like push that aside because you know it makes us feel a certain way because that is part of the history of the country and like there are the people who want to ban books because it depicts us in a negative light or whatnot and no that's we can't just like cherry pick the historical events even though they're trying to it's it's and how else can you learn from those past events if you don't know about them right so cool exactly so i think um the one thing that really stood out to me which was kind of upsetting about the film is that the the thing that was making the most noise so to speak that what i saw on twitter or x was that about the length of the film and how some theaters were making their own intermissions which oh yeah which was it's i mean i get it but if the filmmaker didn't make a intermission point don't i don't think theaters should be like oh we're gonna stop it right here yeah. what not because that's just I it think ruined. That it's hard because there are people that are like physically i don't think can get through a three and a half hour movie without having to go yeah. to the restroom so for those people i think that it's it's hard for them to to kind of endure so it's nice for them to break it so that those people can take like a, a restroom break um i didn't i had sat through it i managed to to sit through the full <laughs> three and a half hours but um you know I, I, I yeah i get that yeah but i don't know it's it's a weird thing that i don't like the fact that that's what's been buzzing the most though is the length of the film and that i, I want the story to be the more um yeah, the talked about yeah. right yeah. yeah all right I, well um what what else is is going on with with, with uh pop culture in your neck of the woods uh well i've watched the two films you mentioned last episode the babysitter I watched part one and part two, and they were fun. They were totally what you how you described them as a fun slasher film. Um, so I thought it was a lot of gore, sometimes unnecessary violence, but it was it was fun to watch. Why not? It was it's, it's still the season. We're recording on October thirtieth, Devil's Night, so it's it's still within the time frame and parameters for that type of movie. I thought it was really cool though. In Babysitter Part Two, um, Killer Queen, they're doing a flashback to one of the one of the main bad guys, I think his name is Max, the guy who always had his shirt off for whatever reason. And um, yeah. in that scene is Rachel Paulson, who I interviewed a couple of weeks ago. So I thought, I was like, hey, I know that person. So it was really cool to see a guest of the show appear in that movie. So I thought that was really cool. That's hilarious. I didn't even know that. Yeah, it, it was it was fun surprise for me. I was like, I know that person. I just talked to them. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. I also watched Scream 6. I'm not sure if you've seen that one. So I haven't seen it yet. So I saw um, the killer babysitter two with Jenna Ortega and of course Samara Weaving's in that as well at the end. And then all of a sudden in Scream Six, there's Samara Weaving again. I was like, wow, what's going on here? So okay. it's yeah, she plays a little cameo. It's nothing major. It's it's pretty cool. I I enjoyed the movie. I mean, it's you know the Scream franchise or legacy, whatever you want to call it. It's it's been reinventing itself, which I think is fun. Although it yeah. brings in the old characters and still using them and and using that the name recognition of them. So it's it's it was cool. Nice. But the main focus that I wanted to touch on in this episode, and if you'll allow me, because it it is today, like I said, October thirtieth, which is the day that this film that I want to talk about is set on. And it's also episode 130. So I thought that was a little fun little correlation, 130, 1030. And that is the film, The Crow. Now we all know, well, hopefully we all know about the movie. Um, it's one of my favorite films uh, and soundtracks. And yeah. so, yeah, I want to talk about The Crow. Let's hear all your takes on it, all your thoughts, memories, moments about it. Um, as far as <clears throat> memories, I think that one of the biggest thing is just for me is the the look and the aesthetics of the film. Mm-hmm. I remember being like really into the aesthetics. Um, it's very nineties, very like mm-hmm. I don't know how you would call it like futuristic goth, like yeah, exactly modern goth, well, nineties um, grunge goth. Um, but I, I remember like being really thinking that Brandon Lee was really cool in the film. That that his look was really cool. 
um the rest of the cast and the characters a really really dark film um mm-hmm. really gritty and so i remember mm-hmm. liking uh that aspect of it the plot was kind of um not something that like i i the pro- plot was sort of like a side note to me like i think that the look of the film and the fighting and the action sequences were like the main thing of the yeah. film mm-hmm. and then mm-hmm. what was kind of like secondary to it um what about you what do you recall from the film i i think you hit it right on the nose right there the the look and the action sequences were like the my favorite part about it so yeah. the darkness the grittiness i think um it was probably one of the first I don't want to say it's a superhero movie, but he's an anti-hero. It was one of the first um, comic book movies that really leaned into that darkness and that grittiness. Because, I mean, there was Batman, right, before. Um, Batman Forever hadn't come out yet. Uh, not Batman Forever. Yeah. Batman Returns is what I was trying to say. That came out already. Um, but it had, yeah. it really leaned into that and it was rated R. And it was just like, you know, it. I think until recently... I hadn't really embraced that darkness of it. And I, so I watched it a couple of days ago and I was like, you know what, this is really cool. Especially if you're leaning into that darker side of it. And of course the music is what really stood out to me as well. Yeah. The, the whole soundtrack, the, um, the soundtrack, I think that was probably one of the first soundtracks that I ever bought with my own money. Um, and oh, nice. I, and I wasn't a real heavy metal guy, you know, wasn't really into that. But hearing that album, I would play it on repeat because it I, it was just so great. I mean, had The Cure, which was a really offshoot to the kind of music The Cure is putting out, right? With their song Burn. It had Nine Inch Nails. It had um, Henry Rollins Band, uh, Violent Femme. So it was, it was such a great album. And I think that more than the film itself, the album stood out to me the most and I've probably listened to it more than I've watched the film. Oh, okay. So, I mean, it's such a, I don't want to detract from the film itself, but the album to me is what stood out the most. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that one of the other things that, that, le- that really lends to the, the, um, I don't know, the coolness or, or the, vibe of the film i wouldn't necessarily say coolness because it's kind of sad but the fact that that <laughs> brandon lee died on on the mm-hmm. set of the film um mm-hmm. makes it you know a little bit more intriguing or um gives it a little bit more of a, an edge i guess yeah. if you will um a lot of people i think were drawn to that because of the news and of what happened and it made him a sort of posthumous icon Mm -hmm. Um, He really became kind of a a cool um, icon, you know, post his death. So uh, I think that was something else that that is interesting about the film is that, you know, he didn't finish the film, that it was finished after he was was deceased and had passed. Yeah. And that is the tragedy of that. Absolutely. Is what draw, I think, drew in a lot of more people than it probably would have before is and of course the history of him and his father, you know, he's of course, Bruce Lee's son and who also passed away at a young age before he really, you know, I mean, he, Bruce Lee had made a few movies before, but he was also a rising star as was Brandon Lee. I saw him before this movie, I saw him in showdown little Tokyo. And I think rapid fire both were, you know, he, he stole the show in both those films and his, his trajectory was like shooting high and for this to happen on set because of a prop gun mishap is just so tragic. And I remember watching, hearing about it and what, not wanting to see the scene where it happened, but also wanting to see the scene that it happened in. And yeah, because you're, it's just so compelling, so sad. And the whole, like I said, this whole story between, and the resemblance of his father's life and career cut short because of a tragedy. It's just, it was, it was a lot. And it it really, I still think about it. I mean, I know the scene that it takes place in now, at least I think I know what scene it is. And it's, it's, it's just so sad that it had to happen because it could have been avoided. Yeah. It's really sad. And, 
it, it kind of film fits with with the story of the film in a way like mm -hmm. you know the the character of the, of the crow you know dies really early on goes you know goes through that whole plot of trying to get revenge and and save his girlfriend or wife or or love interest and um you know and and it, it, that whole like sad you know uh unfortunate series of events kind of mm -hmm. that into real life and so i think that that's what kind of makes it a little a bit more interesting is that it sort of was like mirroring real life was yeah. mirroring arts and art was mirroring real life so um yeah definitely a cool uh film uh really and a lot of things that that are interesting about it um but you mentioned that it is what devil's night is that what you said that it takes mm -hmm. place um so yeah. that would be the day before halloween or halloween that's the day before halloween that's when like all the people go cause mayhem you know just cause a bunch of unruliness i guess all right so what, yeah. what are your plans for devil's night <laughs> <laughs> Well, after we're done here, let me list the places where I will be lighting on fire. No. <laughs> I am probably going to go watch another scary movie. Finish one up tonight. I know um, the new Exorcist Believer, I think, is out on digital. I might go oh, yeah. try and I might go try and watch that. I know you're not a big fan of it. Um, there's a new one on Apple TV about a poltergeist. Uh, what's it called? One second. That's interesting. I might watch that. Uh, if I could find it, I'll let you know what it is. It's it's something. I got an email about it today. Uh... I've been trying to ch to watch the um, on Hulu. They have American Horror Story stories. Oh, I saw that. Yeah, really... mm -hmm. yeah. I haven't watched them yet, but they look kind of cool. Yeah, they do look interesting. I mean, it and it, what's cool about those, I guess, is that they're each episode is its own encapsulated story. So yeah. you don't have to watch the whole season. You can just get a quick fix of whatnot. So yeah. the one on Apple TV is called The Einfeld Poltergeist. It's a documentary experience, a chilling true story of the world's most famous poltergeist case through original audio recordings made inside the house as the events unfolded. I think that's the family that The Conjuring 2 is based off of. Oh, okay. Is it? So, does it say that it happens in, in England? Or in the um, UK. It doesn't let's see episode one details it, the Hodgson family. That's all it says. Huh. Uh, I'm pretty sure that that's the one that's based that the conjuring two was based on. That sounds familiar. But I'll have to check it out. Oh yeah, it says UK, so it looks interesting. Yeah, yeah. I think that that's the that's the the family. Okay. So we'll we'll watch that and then we'll report about it next episode. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I think scary season is like all year round for me. I don't have to watch, you know, stuff solely for <laughs> Halloween. I watch scary stuff all the time, so I'll continue <laughs> to watch scary stuff. There you go. Um, and your shirt is a Halloween shirt, which is cool. And going back to the crow, I remember that I wanted to dress up as the crow. For Halloween, like immediately after that movie came out, I think it was in 94 or so. It would have been like 95, 96. I wanted to dress up as that, but I just, I did the face paint, but just couldn't pull off the the black look with the clothes and whatnot. Yeah. But yeah, maybe it, yeah you have to have a certain aesthetic yeah. uh, to be able to pull it off. But um, I remember that that was a very popular costume, though, definitely during the 90s. A lot of guys mm -hmm. dressed up as that was like the precursor to like people being dressed up as like Keith Ledger's Joker. Um, I think that that was a really popular one as well. It's funny you say that because as I was watching it the other day and I was watching um, Brandon Lee's performance and I was and I saw a lot of Heath Ledger in it. So I was like, wow, he must have watched that and got inspired by that because a lot of the mannerisms, the facial expressions, even the makeup itself, it was really drew from Eric Draven in The Crow. So I thought that was really interesting. Yeah. Hmm. I definitely will have to go revisit the film because it's been quite some time since I've watched it. Oh, OK. Yeah. Give it a watch. It's yeah. good. <laughs> So everyone out there, you should, should watch it as well. And then also watch the Einfeld Poltergeist along with us so we can all get scared together. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> uh, anything else you have for this week? No, that's all it. I've, I've been watching and kind of 
been, you know, viewing about pop culture lately. Very cool. Well then, thanks for showing up. <laughs> Everyone out there, thanks for tuning in. Thanks for liking and subscribing and leave us a comment. Let us know what your thoughts are about the Crow um, soundtrack and film, what your favorite song is if you like the soundtrack. Um, and if you're going to watch the Einfeld Poltergeist with us, tune in next week so we can do a recap of it. That's pretty good. All right, stay safe, everyone. I stole your lines.